First, I want to thank uh, Lumina and Lens for the real honor and privilege to be here uh, as uh, president of one of those places that is getting lambasted properly. Um, uh, it is, uh, in some ways, fascinating to have a chance to urge you on. Uh, it, I'm going to change, I think, the conversation in order to get in it. I think one of the problems of our conversations about education is that we keep avoiding what I would call fundamentals. Uh, what are we talking about? What is education? Um, why does it arouse the enormous interest and fascination uh, on the one hand, um, and how can we account for its spectacular failure on the other? Uh, and in order to do this, I think we have to talk about fundamentals, which we never do. Uh, and I think it is also only when we get at very, what students call deep thought, do you get radical innovation. Uh, at least that's my experience. Uh, so that's what I'm, I'm going to do. I'm going to do it as quickly as I can. Uh, the excitement of this conference makes that harder because I find myself desperately wanting to respond. And I am going to take a minute to respond to a couple of things. One is, Cameron Sinclair's presentation, everything I say, everything, is a gloss on his presentation from the perspective of looking at what he's saying in terms of what it would mean if what he's talking about and exhibiting is at the center of the educational enterprise. To put it simply, if you are going to understand Cameron Sinclair, you have to start by saying he is a human being. You have to start by talking about what are his characteristics as a person that account for his work that cannot possibly be captured by anything narrower than that, such as being an architect or even a socially active architect. And I would argue that any serious education, I don't care what it is, where it is, or how it is, if it does not start with fundamentals about what it means to be a human being is going to miss what this conference is after. And that's a big sense, what that means. Because among other things, it means we have to get rid of something that has dominated the educational scene for the last 150 years. And it is what finally somebody told me I was talking about, so thank you, they're not here. And that is a fundamentalism about expertise. It isn't a question of whether you need to know what you're talking about. As Cameron points out, it would be a problem if the building falls down. But that is very different from thinking that the only model of serious accomplishment, the only model of a serious education, is one in which you become progressively sophisticated about something narrower and narrower Frankly, a model in which learning less and less about less and less is the ultimate accomplishment. And that is, ladies and gentlemen, the model we live with. And I don't care where you are in this country, that model dominates, shapes, trains the people who are educated, and leads to these endless refrains like, how can you possibly be up to date in your field, and how can you possibly be a serious educator if you are not constantly doing research. Nobody is asking research about what uh, and how does that really, what does that really translate into. I'm going to tell a quick story in response to the visualization idea, um, and that is to both challenge it and, and applaud it. The concept of education being generated by the person being educated is a powerful, powerful idea. It's an old idea, actually. Uh, and one other thing I want to stand for here and say over and over again is, if you want radical thinking, don't just look this way, look that way. Uh, uh, Tim O'Reilly, is it? Uh, it didn't surprise me when he referred to a Greek crowd. Um, and his own history, I believe, has something to do with that. If you want some radical thinking, uh, read Plato more later. Um, 
But the, the concept alone, I don't think, works. So it's a very powerful beginning. But without an understanding of what it means then to educate someone where that's where you start is something that has to be engaged. Bennington College has actually used that as the model of education since it began in 1932. It's called the plan process. And every single student at Bennington has the obligation and responsibility of ultimately designing their own education. You notice I said responsibility and obligation. It is an enormously challenging process. And it takes people around you and institutions around you that understand what it means. And to be not glib, but fast about it, the, cri the critical craft of the teacher is to listen. Let me tell you, that is not the critical craft of the academy. So what I want to argue here, passionately even, is that don't give up on changing the academy. Don't continue to work at the margins. Don't be satisfied that there are universities of Phoenix and Bennett that are doing magnificent things. Don't sit back and say, oh, fine, because people are getting degrees from many institutions. Until we get at fundamentals about the institution itself and how we think about education, you are going to be working at, mar at the margins, and the world can't afford for the people in this room to be working at the margins. So what I want to be talking about is not the limitations of institutions, but their power and what it means to get them right. And for those of you who don't think it's possible to change institutions, remember that it's important to remember that the model of the expert is very new, that 200 years ago they wouldn't have known what we were talking about, that it was in the 19th century that Humphrey Davies was the most popular lecturer in London, and he was talking about chemistry. And thousands and thousands of people came to listen to him. And the idea, the insane idea, that human beings can only be interested in one thing, and that the progression of a serious education is to jettison everything but one interest, is a bizarre idea. And it utterly dominates the landscape of education. What then are the fundamentals that we need to start with if we're going to challenge this? I want to just, sorry, just add one thing. Uh, using Bennington again, I apologize. This is not meant to be about Bennington. In 1932, when Bennington started, and of course, to start in 1932 shows you insanity at its best, <laughs> uh, the idea that the visual and performing arts were an equal, equal, not more or less, but equal partner in a liberal education was unheard of, 1932. Today, there is not a college, not a college that I know of in the country that doesn't make some kind of gesture, and often huge gestures, to the importance of the visual and performing arts. So it, if you have a powerful idea, if it matters, if it can connect with human beings, if it involves taking human beings seriously, and you are talking about an institution whose fundamental obligation is to make the world a better place, and that is the job of education, it has no logic existing if it is not changing something. Not only is its job to change, it's to transform. When that's the obligation of an institution, you have a great place to start. But if you start by insisting, which happens all too often in my experience and in this room all too often as well, is we start with a sense of the world as it is. And the job of education is to somehow facilitate success in that world. That is not the job of educational institutions. And moreover, it does it terribly. Since the 80s, and the report came out about the disaster in education in this country, Millions and millions and millions, probably by now billions of dollars, have been poured into education to do just what you're talking about here. How do we make America competitive in the world economically? We have failed totally in that agenda. The numbers of dropouts from high schools and colleges increases by the minute. The reason it fails is because that is something we are terrible at. What we can be great at is transforming the 
possibilities of every one of our students for what they are going to do in the world about things that matter. Uh, and that's what I want to now begin to talk about it as, as specifically and concretely as I can. What are the things that we have as educators? Simple. We have the remarkable capacity of human beings to think. I'm talking human beings. I am not talking about rich human beings, poor human beings, privileged human beings, unprivileged. I am talking about human beings, the stunning resourcefulness of human beings when confronted and in situations where they are dealing with things that matter in a collective process which has a shape and a trajectory that is continually working on what does it mean to develop that resourcefulness and that capacity to change human possibilities about things that matter. And I now have 30 seconds, and I'm dead. Uh, um, <laughs> OK, let me, let me take it, put a zero on that, uh, if I can. Um, and uh, let me add something else quickly, and then I'll move as fast as I can. Uh, there's an additional obligation of education in a democracy which we have not heard in this room, and that's a problem. You cannot have a viable democracy without a powerful education and an education that has to do with not private goods, but public goods. And I would further argue that you cannot have a quality education of any kind if you are not talking about things that matter to people that matter to us collectively, that have the enormity and the importance so that, quote, the big questions are on the table. So what do you do when you preside over an institution in a world where big questions are off the table, where the very idea of the educated generalist has disappeared? To go back to Cameron, the idea of the educated generalist does not exist when breadth is equivalent to shallow and depth is equivalent to the recondite. It's over. Until we change that, until we recover and renew and rebuild an idea that education is about our totality of resources, the resources that span the range of different ways in which people will put them to use, until we make things like design fundamental to a new liberal arts, the way people think who design, until we think about rhetoric and the way one puts words together, until we think about the kind of thinking that is going on in this room and getting at what are the conditions of it, making those fundamental to what the capacities are we are dealing with, we are not going to break the cycle of failure uh, in this country vis-a-vis -vis the issues that a democracy is dealing with. And I don't think I have to belabor the spectacular urgency and catastrophe we are facing in this country, never mind the world, when it comes to addressing the great challenges of our time, whether they are environment, where the, whether they are the growing inequities that dominate the resources in this country, whether it has to do with our devastating predilection for the uses of force and a lack of developed understanding of alternative sources of power, uh, whether it's health, and I would have to say that the debate over health for the last six months does not encourage one about the quality of our public life. So when you look at the big picture, which is bigger even than the picture you've been getting in this room, small solutions simply don't work. There's different kinds of scale. And the scale that we have to be thinking about is education capable of addressing big questions of monumental importance and doing it creatively and effectively and systemically. So let me end by saying education with all its limits remains the great hope. Because if you can do something about education, you have done something fundamental and systemic. And what Bennington has decided to do in its determination to do, I mean, if no one else is going to do it, we'll do it. Uh, so we're not Georgetown. Who cares? The, the thing we decided as we struggled to figure out what do you do was to take the problems themselves. So those problems are things like what to do about health, what to do about inequity, economic inequity, what to do about environmental and sustainable issues with respect to 
energy and climate change, and et cetera, what to do about uh, the challenges of governance in this country, which are vast, to make those the center of the curriculum, those issues, to replace the, the status of the disciplines, to make those the centers of inquiry, uh, which opens up and deepens a curriculum in all kinds of ways, which I, alas, am not going to have any time to talk to you about at the moment. Um, and I want to end by telling you of an, of an initiative that we are about to uncork as a way to suggest to you what I started with, which is making connections and the way Cameron works, which is to, no accident, he says it's an accident. What he did when he was three minutes old was he started seeing the world in terms of how things connect. That's thinking. Uh, what we plan to do, among other things, is to start a fund that's t t devoted to ideas about social entrepreneurism. You've heard it a million times, right? Everybody's doing that. It's going to have a committee of people who are going to decide what projects deserve, deserve to be funded. They will be for profit. So to succeed, you have to make money. Uh, they will be embedded, and this is what no one's figured out, in the curriculum. So they will emerge out of these areas, health, education is of course one of them which I left out, uses of force, et cetera. Here's the point. In order to figure out where to invest money of all the possibilities in ways that are sustainable is an enormous intellectual challenge. And that's what we've missed. We've missed the fact that the power of action and the need to act effectively in the world is an enormous source of intensifying, not diminishing, the power of thinking. And let me end by saying, if you want to read The Republic the way it was written, read it as a passionate quest for justice, something that everyone can understand, not as a subject for another PhD dissertation. Thank you.